everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining us for today's webinar. Uh, my name is Mary Jane and I handle event and marketing at Singapore Fintech Association. So today we will be presenting a webinar part of our Grow Your Business series titled Defy the Odds and Challenges for Success. This session will be moderated by Amy. Um, so it's just some housekeeping rules before we get started. If you have any questions during the presentation, please feel free to type them in the panel box below under the Q&A. Um, it will be brought up during the presentation and we will also have time for a Q&A session towards the end. So now without further ado, I'll turn the time over to Amy. Amy, please. And thank you so much, Mary Jane. Good morning, everyone. Thank you guys for taking the time and joining us. Uh, my name is Amy. I'm the head of sales for Fireblocks and APAC as uh, part two of a uh, three part series that we're doing with Singapore Fintech Association and Hong Kong Fintech Association. Um, today I'm joined by three incredible panelists to discuss DeFi. So perhaps we can start with the panelists introducing themselves, their firms, and then how they're involved uh, in DeFi currently. Um, Darius, perhaps you could kick us off and then we can go over to Daniel and Steven. Sure. Uh, you, you can hear me okay, yeah? Yes. Yeah, so my name is Darius. I'm the founder of QCP Capital. Um, we were founded in 2017. Uh, we are a full suite cryptocurrency trading firm. Um, we trade uh, crypto spot, uh, derivatives, especially options. Um, we do investments. And more recently, we've been uh, doing a lot more incubating and project building as well. Um, so uh, we, you know, I think... We, we have, we started from uh, trading on DeFi, investing in DeFi to now building on DeFi as well. So, you know, we have incubated some, some uh, a few uh, projects such as uh, DeFi options vaults and the like, and happy to go into more detail on that, you know, as we go into the conversation. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Daniel? Yeah, so a uh, quick introduction of myself. So I'm Daniel Un, uh, leading DeFi at the Algorand Foundation. So my job scope, uh, it's, it's really about building and, and helping Algorand scale DeFi uh, from the protocol's perspective. So it will be really cool to be able to share more about this during this panel. Yeah. Good. And Stephen? Yep. Uh, my name is Stephen Richardson. I head our APEC business here at Fireblocks. Um, uh, Fireblocks is a digital asset infrastructure company. Uh, where we really focus on enabling and, and helping our customers uh, grow and scale in, in, the, in the digital asset space, um, particularly around DeFi. We've been seeing an emergence of DeFi activity uh, by our customers, and, and what we're really doing is helping folks connect into the different DeFi applications, as well as think about the security and the infrastructure that's properly needed to really operate in this space safely, at least from an infrastructure perspective. So um, excited to be on this panel uh, with the group here. Great. Um, thanks for that. So maybe we can start off by talking openly around the trends that you're seeing in DeFi, right? Maybe Daniel, if you'd like to kick us off uh, with some of the trends you're seeing, how are folks getting involved? Uh, what are some exciting things being developed there? Yeah, so I, I, I would say that there's a lot of things being built on DeFi right now. And no, uh, Darius actually mentioned about you no know, options and, and, and derivatives. And I think that's really one of the most exciting parts, actually. So a couple of months back, we actually saw the the, the big launch of uh, DYDX, right? And then I think that's really exciting because when you have uh, smart contracts able to facilitate complex financial transactions, I think that's really pushing the envelope on towards the next level. So that's one thing that we are noticing. The second part is really the interconnectedness of our blockchains, actually. So that's via bridging. Also super exciting, you know, in the past, users had to use centralized ex exchanges to actually facilitate sending of cryptos. Right now, you they could just use bridges, actually. And I think bridges are really helping uh, different blockchains right, really get connected. Yeah, and I, I would say that the, the last part is really the rise and rise of stable coins. Uh, that's really taking, like, really one of the, the forefront of DeFi, actually, like, the whole stablecoin industry really growing massively. And I think that's really a focus you know, yeah, that, that a lot of users are looking at right nowadays. Yeah, yeah and, and just to follow up question, really, when you mentioned stablecoins, can you talk a little bit around, you know, what, because I think for the folks on the, on the call, there's different kinds of stablecoins, right? Uh, maybe you can walk a little bit, us through a little bit of landscapes there. Yeah, so I, I, in, in terms of stablecoins, I think the, the, the granddaddy that everybody knows about is really USDT. 
like you know Darius and, and myself probably heard about USDT and been using using USDT for a long time. Those are I would say like you no know, traditional stable coins as we know it, asset back uh, to a certain extent. And then you have you know Circle with USDC, you have Paxos, PAX, and and these are all really just asset back stable coins. The the rise and rise of stable coins really came in two chapters, right? The first chapter is really the experimentation of uh of algor of of algo stable coins, algorithmic stable coins, and that's really backed by math actually. And uh, with with the rise of what's happening at at, at Terra Luna with UST right now, that's also taking uh the, the main stage. The idea is that stable coins being the fundamental uh, asset that a lot of people settle their trades with, uh, on chain or off chain, that's really taking a large chunk of like how is it profitable. So the idea is that. If you were to run a stable coin in the past, it used to be unprofitable, but nowadays it could be profit for profitable actually. And I think that's really getting super interesting. Yeah. Great. That's awesome. Thank you for sharing. Um, Darius, and, and on your side, I think we kind of alluded to around options on, on DeFi. Um, could you share a bit more there and then really what you're seeing in terms of that space? Well, I think, you know, just uh, sort of taking a step back from what Daniel has shared uh, to understand what DeFi is effectively, right? <clears throat> DeFi is uh, the fi a financial ecosystem, uh, you know, a financial ecosystem that is based on crypto. So um, if you really look at it, it is the only independent, non-sovereign, non-aligned financial ecosystem, meaning that uh, it's, it's the only uh, uh, existing scalable ecosystem where you can invest, where you can uh, trade uh, that is not linked to any, any bank, any sovereign, any country. And I think that's very significant uh, in the times that we are living in, right? And, and I, think, uh, I think people are, have underpriced the significance of DeFi, given how economic warfare has been carried out in the last, in this year, right? With, uh, China's, with Russia's attack on Ukraine, uh, what we saw, I think what some interesting observations that we had was, if you look at all the, Dis the DeFi Discord channel, uh, when, the, when, the, when the invasion happened, and uh, with the way that, that the, the world retaliated, you know, sanctions of Russia, um, <clears throat> suddenly you realize that the world is very, very centralized. And not just centralized, you realize that the, the centralized world is, uh, has a lot of power on your, on, on your personal finances. Uh, so if you're Russian <coughs> or if you're Chinese, we saw uh, Discord activity from Russia and China go through the roof for, for most DeFi projects because suddenly you realize that, you know, if you're holding RMB or holding rubles, if your, if your country attacks another country, you know, you can lose your half your assets in a second, you know, right? So, um, so it really is the, the, it's, it really is the, the, uh, um, the only non-aligned financial ecosystem. And then we go from there, you know, so how, how does DeFi solve problems and, and you know, replicate our experiences in Thread5. How does it do, does it do it better? Does it do it worse? Um, what stage of evolution are we at? And I think, you know, for options, for example, just, a, a, just one simple use case, right? Um, options in DeFi are mostly scalable right now through the DeFi options vaults. And the reason is, is, it is so, uh, is because, uh, you know, there are problems with managing non-linearity on DeFi, you know, because you are doing the same thing in, in ThreadFi, but without intermediary. So you have to do things in innovative ways so that you don't need an intermediary. And, you know, we're, always, we're really just at the first step where we're trying to, you know, uh, allow people to use or rather get yield from options without having an intermediary. And we are at the very first step where it's very simple, vanilla, uh, fully collateralized. But the question then is where, where we go from here. So I, I, I think, you know, uh, that, that's what I wanted to uh, share. That's great. Um, and maybe I could just follow up. You, you, you ended off exactly where I think the folks wanted to hear more. Where could we go from here? What is the next step? And what are you seeing being developed there? Yeah, sure. I mean, there, there are a few key things that, that we think, uh, you know, DeFi brought to the table. Um, Daniel mentioned a couple of them. <coughs> um, I think the key building blocks are firstly the AMM model, which is the uh, automated market maker, uh, providing creating liquidity uh, for 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 trading without a market maker, without an intermediary. Uh, it's a it's not a perfect model. Uh, there are a lot of inefficiencies with it, 
but it's the first time you you have a you know you have a effectively a just pure code that is uh making prices on 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 on, on swaps and tokens um so that's that's one building block the second building block i i see is the the DeFi options vault which is the ability to trade non-linear products um fully collateralized you know you allow uh you allow folks to to stake um their their assets their dollars their, their coins the tokens and you know sell options on, on these market makers come in and buy everything the entire process the settlement press discovery um the uh um the 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 uh, uh the collateral management is all on chain market makers buy the options and then manage the risk off chain very nice elegant model the problem is you know it's all one week vanilla put, one puts and calls uh and we haven't moved on to further tenors more complicated products so you see, I think two 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 major two major building blocks for us, right? AMMs, DOVs. Um, for AMMs, and I think a lot of protocols are trying to develop and a more a more efficient way of doing AMMs, where you don't rely on uh, arbitrages to get to get the 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 the, the price, uh, uh, you know, of to 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 get the price of of the the tokens, right? Um, where you are, are you able to improve liquidity, um, and uh, it's it's just not. It's, I mean, so maybe a step back is, is to say that uh, um, DeFi in its current form is very new. Uh, it's kind of clunky. Uh, if you compare it to TradFi models where it's a lot more complicated, where you have intermediary smoothing out the process, DeFi is a lot more clunky. I think where we have been looking at is trying to build the pieces that make it less clunky, um, build the pieces that, you know, in five, 10 years time, when the next generation, when the younger generation is, using this instead of banks for personal investments uh for personal finance uh, the process is more seamless and a lot more um smooth than it is now if that makes sense yeah i mean so so to darius's point i i think you know he raised he raised the point of uh of how did it come to be right because i think that's important in, in terms of thinking about the the general crypto native se segment right so if you look at it, right, there was this idea that you had all these centralized exchanges, there was an extreme amount of risk, potentially in terms of operating there, right, and then you built a platform and a system that basically decentralized that risk, right, in a lot of ways. Um, and basically, you know, folks are in the crypto native segment are, are really operating at a speed and pace that that I, I think uh, can't be rivaled, right? And so if you look at, for example, what FTX is trying to do with clearing futures trades, right? Even in like the traditional segment, right? You'd argue that that came out of like the crypto native space, right? And the fact that exchanges were operating in this function, right? And DeFi is basically starting to emerge in that same way, right? The clunkiness of the system, I think is starting to be kind of uh, uniformly addressed. Right, and that in turn is going to build a model that I think a lot of folks are going to replicate. So I can speak from more of an infrastructure example is that like from our perspective, we're thinking more around uh, how do we manage the security around all these different components, right? How the interaction between uh, funding wallets uh, and your treasury wallets to all these different DeFi applications and maintaining a level of security that's required. Because I think we think that uh, there's going to be a lot of innovation in the way that these different DeFi applications operate and the smoothness of them are going, it's gonna improve. And so really it's the security around that and the ability for folks that are interacting with these applications to be able to manage you know, how they interact, uh, how much funds can be pulled from a particular wallet within a, a, a set of defined contracts, et cetera, right? Now, I think if you look at where, you know, we sit as Fireblocks, which is operating bridging between, let's say, crypto native, et cetera, banks are exploring, right, how do you look at what the crypto native segment is doing with decentralized, you know, clearing settlement and like trading and uh, lending activities, and how do you bring that into the traditional space, right? So they're looking at DeFi as a learning opportunity to say, how do we get rid of intermediaries that cost money, make it more expensive for folks to be able to trade, make it more efficient, inefficient for settlement and clearing, and then how do we then bring that across? So I would say you're actually seeing a number of traditional financial institutions look at building DEXs on their own, even in experimental phases, to basically start to understand how they can build networks 
that today rely on you know financial market infrastructure to be able to enable clearing and settlement and say oh wow what do we what does that look like when more assets are tokenized when we have more you know proliferation of stable coins from banks based off of commercial bank money uh and then how do we then enable more efficient settlement i think the the kind of the pace of that change is being led by you know folks like darius uh and daniel here so so i think that that becomes a really interesting thing to pay attention to so Stephen, you, you brought up you know traditional um fis getting involved in DeFi, and then naturally um the question i have for you is really around the regulation around it right yeah. a lot of the folks when it comes to traditional banks etc they are really focusing on adopting this technology um but but you know they need also to be compliant to certain regulations um are you seeing that happening in this space? How do you really perceive that perceive what will develop? Because ultimately, right now, when it comes to DeFi adoption and where that's being led, it's, it's mostly crypto native businesses uh, that are operating in that space. So, so what are you seeing there? Yeah, look, I, I think in general, we always have this adoption curve where crypto native folks are out ahead right, of, of regulators by uh, a significant number of years, right? But what I think is slightly different is the, uh, the level that I think uh, crypto native players are now engaging with regulators to help them understand they're building businesses, they're in jurisdictions, whether it be Dubai, Singapore, uh, Germany, Switzerland, and others. And I think there's more of a voice to uh, wanting to increase uh, the level of adoption at retail, right? And, and in order to increase the level of adoption at retail and to institute these new models, right? It's important that uh, I think our story or the crypto native story is told properly in terms of what's the right safeguards and other things that are being put in place. I think, for example, if you look at Baffin in Germany, they put out a paper on DeFi that I'd argue was actually relatively progressive, right? It didn't bash the potential of DeFi, but rather it said, you know, while there are inherent risks to operating in this space, we think there's a lot of utility in what it's applying or what it's trying to do and, and replicate different models, uh, financial models, and make them more efficient. Um, and it's a space to watch, right? There wasn't an outright, uh, let's say, fundamental, we're against it, right? If you look at the UK and what they're trying to do in terms of uh, NFTs, Web3 and, and DeFi, I think uh, Boris Johnson has come out and said quite actively, we want to be the space. Now, again, there's a little bit of a dissonance between what's being said there and what the regulator is doing at the moment, but we aren't seeing just like an outright basis. So I think, you know, from a regulatory perspective, in order for wider adoption to continue to occur and for kind of more mainstream money to get into space, I think regulation becomes important. I do think in places like what we're doing at Fireblocks, we're working and trying to understand what the limits are, right? And, and in some ways, the limits are around things like uh, KYC and AML, right? And the ability for you to know. And so we've looked at things like permission DeFi pools, uh, where you're able to operate uh, and leverage the technology itself. Um, one, to not take centralized risk to any particular you know, party from an intermediary's perspective, but still allow the efficiency of the technology to occur while understanding that there's still some level of a ring fence that allows you know, uh, different retail services platforms and banking institutions and asset managers that are regulated to actually then operate in this space and become more familiar with it. So I think, you know, in the interim, there are going to be things like these permission DeFi pools that start to grow. I think in the long term, I think the space is doing an active, a strong, active job engaging with regulators under explaining the technology uh, to make it more widely adopted uh, across the board. Got it. Awesome. And speaking of, of adoption, this kind of lead into my, my next question, right? And I think when we talk about DeFi as a topic, it's, it's incredibly wide. There are actually many ways folks are adopting adopting DeFi. And, uh, uh, you know, maybe this, I could throw it over to, to Darius just to start. You know, is yield farming still the thing? From a strategy perspective, how are people adopting DeFi? What are they looking at? Um, obviously, you mentioned, you know, uh, 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 derivatives. That's one aspect of it. But what else are they looking at? Well, I mean, you know, um... From DeFi summer started with uh, you know the yield farming, uh, you know the crazy yields. I think you know that was a great start. <clears throat> the problem with that model is that it's very, uh, it's it's a bit self defeating because it's inflationary, right? A lot of the yield comes from uh, native tokens being printed by protocols being distributed, <clears throat> and the more you distribute, the more folks sell it. 
to the yield compressors. <coughs> so <coughs> one big trend that we've seen in the, um, uh, the, the last couple of months is a very big yield compression in DeFi. Um, and it's, it's expected, right? I mean, it, it was, when we first started, you know, we had the crazy 10,000% yields and, you know, it's come down to single digit type yields. And, and, you know, we see, we see Luna try to do it to anchor, uh, trying to prop up those yields, but it, it gets crushed because again, it's an insular model. You, you distribute the tokens, people sell your tokens. Uh, what, what we have tried to champion is, uh, through the DeFi options vaults where the yield is external. It comes from the uh, monetization of the underlying volatility of, of the, the tokens. So, you know, you have an external yield and then you compound it by doing the cross, cross protocol, collateral swaps, uh, collateral move, movements to get extra, uh, and then also a token distribution to get the extra yield. So I think, you know, we, 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 as, as the phases go on, you know, we learn, we learn for each, from each phase. Uh, now it's options, you know, starting to see derivatives and, and, and to what Steven said, I think it's very important uh, to get institutions in somehow as well uh, through permission pools so that they, you know, there is very strong demand for, for, for this kind of yield in the private banking world, right? Uh, you know, they, they are yield staffed and crypto becomes a, an, almost like an oasis where there's, you know, triple digit volatility uh, that can create structured products that, that, are, that are brilliant. And I think we will, we will see a lot of institutional demand, you know, bring into this space as well. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, as we, we you know, I think we, we, as we go along, we, we're starting to see uh, different models of, of creating this yield. Uh, and more importantly, I think, you know, different ways of us interacting on DeFi as well. Uh, but yeah, I think generally the theme has always been, the DeFi crowd has always been a yield hungry one. So, you know, I think, you know, we, 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 that it's going to go along this, this theme and we innovate and see how we extract the most yield as possible out of different financial products on DeFi. That's great. Makes sense. Uh, and Dana, I'll go back to you in just a second, because I think the topic of uh, permission DeFi has been mentioned a couple of times. So I figure we should probably address that first uh, for, for the broader audience. Um, let's start with, you know, uh, uh, Stephen, like, uh, what is permission DeFi? Right. What does that mean for, for, for the broader audience? Um, and then my second follow up question to both, you know, all the three panelists is um, obviously that is a really interesting concept. But where is the adoption happening for, from that space? Right. So so if you look at like the broader crypto native segment, it initially against centralized exchanges, right, you would onboard to these exchanges uh, over time, right, to meet like directives for, you know, things from a FATF and AML perspective, eventually more and more exchanges started doing KYC, right? So when you want to onboard to an exchange, uh, you put in your passport information or some level of ID, uh, and then you can operate on that exchange. Now, while every par party doesn't know exactly who they're trading with and who they're settling with, you know, at least a centralized entity uh, has uh, in some ways KYC'd or at least uh, verified the identity of all the people operating on the exchange. Uh, from a DeFi perspective, uh, given they were decentralized uh, applications, uh, there was no central basis. When they launched, uh, anyone with a wallet, right, could in essence connect into a DeFi application, right, which meant that you didn't really know uh, who you were trading with, who you were settling with, uh, you know, who you were lending to, et cetera. Like there was no view on where those funds were coming from. Um, and, and that was an issue. So for regulated entities, um, this idea that uh, who you're receiving funds from or who you're trading or exchanging uh, funds for settlement with, you have no idea who they are or if they are uh, Iranians or illicit gambling or any of those things. While a small portion of, of the, the crypto space overall, you just don't know, um, was something that regulated entities couldn't take risk with. So the idea of permission DeFi you think about like a, a dark pool and FX or, or any of these other components is this idea that uh, you have the same technology application, right? The same settlement mechanisms, the same code basis, but in essence, uh, all the participants have been whitelisted, right? So uh, they've all been vetted via some level of KYC. Um, and so when they're actually connecting their wallets uh, to the, the, the pool, those wallets are whitelisted on the basis of passing some level of a KYC and AML check, 
Now, you still don't know exactly who you're settling against. You still don't know um, the identity of the person on the other side, but you do know there's some level of commonality that everyone has gone through the same level of screening, right? And so it still provides the same level of, let's say, efficiencies around the idea that there are no intermediaries and there's no centralized clearing counterparties and risk to centralized entity and all the other things that you know this uh, DeFi is enabling but it mitigates a lot of the risk around uh, answering the question to a regulator in terms of who you're participating in a certain pool or in a certain application against, right? And so, you know, that's the basis of DeFi, uh, of permission pools in, in DeFi. Um, some might say it's a hybrid of bringing in the new with the old, right? Uh, and it's not entirely decentralized in a, in a basis, but I think it's, it's a step one until we get more towards uh, tokenized KYC information and other things that will allow us to get increased efficiency in the space. That's great. And, and then I think my, my follow-up question to that, and again, I'm open to the broader audience, we both Daniel and Darius, is, is it's a bit of a chicken neck situation, right? I think I think the infrastructure could be there for permission, but you know, to your point, Darius, earlier, that the yield is not. Um, so how do you balance the two, right? Getting folks involved, building infrastructure for it, then at the same time, because most of yield in DeFi is driven by retail. Um, so how do you see that play out with permission DeFi? Well, you know, uh, there has been a bit of experiment with Ave Arc already, right? The Fireblocks was, was uh, doing, <clears throat> hasn't been, I don't think the traction has been that, 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 that great. Um, you know, I think, uh, really early days with, with this as well. I think, you know, uh, still trying to figure out exactly what the banks, you know, banks, financial institutions, what the appetite is, I think there's still a bit of lack of understanding as to what exactly is DeFi to them. Um, you know, um, whether they can manage a balance sheet off chain and whether they can conduct activ activity off chain. But I'm sure at Firebox, you guys are seeing a lot of this as well. Mm -hmm. um, and I think uh, <clears throat> there are a lot of scary problems to solve as well, right? I mean, um, even before we go there, if we look at the recent uh, Ronin hack, right? Uh, it wasn't a, it was an exploit, it was a wallet issue, right? Uh, essentially something that Firebox could have solved, uh, you know, if, 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 if they were using a, a, a proper uh, multi stick in, in effect, right? Um, I guess, you know, uh, th there are quite a few infrastructural issues to, to resolve and a bit of an educational process before we even talk about institutions coming in. Um, but, but of course, I think, uh, uh, an easy way, I think, would be to, instead of having them participate directly uh, as, as counterparties, perhaps, you know, perhaps start by structuring some kind of notes for them to issue to their clients and that kind of thing. I think that's probably a, 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 more, a more palatable first step than, you know, expecting institutions to, uh, traditional financial institutions to come in and, and, and participate as uh, trading participants on the DEX, for example. Great, awesome. And, and, and Daniel, on your side, um, you know, from Algorand's perspective, um, is that something you guys are looking at as well from a permissioned perspective, um, how are folks adopting there? Yeah, definitely. So to, to kind of add on to what uh, Stephen and, and Darius, Darius have basically shared, right? So one thing we have noticed is that we are kind of observing this uh, B2C version of permission DeFi kind of taking flight uh, on the Algorand side of things. So they are mostly tackling it via the payment rails side of things. So what do I mean by that is you have example transfer wise, right? That's sending funds cross border. You also have Western Union uh, charging insane fees to people who are sending cash uh, on both ends. So one, one type of permission DeFi we, are, we have kind of observed is that, uh, you know, they, they basically use, utilize current infrastructure that's on chain as well as, or off-chain CRMs to actually settle. So if let's say you were sending funds from, for example, Australia to Cambodia, for example, it will usually cost you X amount in terms of percentage fees. Uh, a, a variant of permission DeFi liquidity pools that goes through, example, circle H API through Fireblocks could basically reduce the amount of fees while not having to use proprietary uh, software, right? example, through WISE, uh, infrastructure and stuff like that. So we are kind of looking at a rise of that side of things, uh, B2C permission DeFi. And it's definitely very interesting because when 
retail users are making the transfers, they are paying the fees and that fees shows up in terms of use actually. So I think there's going to be some kind of like synergy between B2C permission DeFi as well as what we call B2B, the trend, the, the idea that permission DeFi is. And I think that's going to be a, a, a pretty high level of synergy if we look towards uh, payment rails actually. Yeah, definitely something that's worth, uh, worth really looking at. Yeah. Great. Um, I'm going to ask a couple of questions that I'm seeing in the Q&A section, given the topic that we're on. So the first question was, was around KYC process, right? Do you folks see a universal requirement in the future for permission DeFi KYC process? Maybe, Stephen, you want to kick us off there? Um, yeah, look, I, I think as in anything, right, it, it's a learning uh, basis. I, I think one of the the views that we have is, you know, where we sit at the intersection between, you know, folks like Algorand and, and then folks like QCP and, and folks like Revolut and others is the ability to try to, in some ways, take a bunch of disparate information and try to get some level of commonality between them. And so I, I do think eventually, right, um, probably like two or three years ago, there was a huge push towards like common KYC information on the blockchain. It kind of died out after a little while. I do think with the more, with the increased basis of uh, more decentralized applications and folks wanting to uh, operate in multiple different pools, I think this will be something that starts to uh, happen again or, or, or starts to get a little bit more revived, right? And the idea of controlling the type of information you have and then creating a common layer of information that's required across these different dApps will be something that I think makes it easier from an adoptive basis, right? I think folks are thinking about like the yields are, are still something that uh, compared to traditional markets are strong. Um, and so, you know, if you're looking at, you know, retail services platforms that have to offer so or looking to expand up the value chain for retail consumers, their ability to get into something like this Will be important and their ability to do so seamlessly with kind of the same set of information or common standards i think will be important so i, I do think that we're going to get closer to uh, a certain level of common kyc um within the space um and, and i think we're trying to do our part at fireblocks to to help push that forward uh in terms of you know the different permission pools that we're looking at and, and looking to work with uh, and and how we make it less complicated for folks to interact in that space. Excellent. Um, I think another question that came through, I, I, I'm going to ask a question in a different way. Maybe this, we start with, with Darius and Daniel, then move on to Steven. Um, the question was around, is it possible to track someone or a particular trading firms uh, on their DeFi activities, right? So wouldn't a, a clever analyst uh, can analyze on-chain data and therefore understand like, who's doing what from, from, a, from that perspective. Um, uh, you know, Darius, is that something you guys are, are looking at? Um, are you guys worried about those type of situations? Um, maybe we'll start there and I'd love to hear both the, from the answer from Daniel and Steven as well. Well, that's an, inter that's an interesting question. Um, I mean, DeFi is a lot more transparent. Uh, you know, we, we, we have, uh, you are able to see, to identify and, and track, you know, various activities on chain. Uh, companies like Nansen do that, do that quite well. Um, <clears throat> so, I mean, some, some folks are quite concerned about, about privacy, but, you know, trading firms, you know, I, I think typically, uh, you know, if we find a good trade and we start trading it, uh, we would like to keep it secret until, you know, uh, un until we, we uh, sort of get the alpha from it already. But once we get the alpha from it, Happy to, to, to have other people see what we're doing, <laughs> typically speaking. And if they join, if they join the trade, it makes it more profitable for me as well. So I think, you know, so I, so I would say it's, it's a big deal, yet not, not, not a huge deal. Um, so I think, uh, you know, pri privacy has its users, but, you know, I think, uh, you know, they, 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 typically when you start a trade and you start doing things, you know, uh, it is easy to, to uh, get some hit, to get a, a sort of a, a, a advantage or sort of, sort of some hit room by you know changing your wallet and refreshing them and, and stuff like that. So I I I would say for us, uh, we do think about it, but but right, just right now, not not a huge issue. I, I I don't think it's a massive issue yet. Got it. Um, Daniel, Stephen, do you guys want to add on, on that topic from what you guys see in your world? So I think it's quite a, a common question that folks ask. Yeah, I, I, I wanted to add on. And I think Darius basically hit the, the, the nail on the head, actually. The idea is that 
DeFi, SOS, uh, crypto blockchain in general is basically a parallel financial system. So you, you have you have pioneers like Darius really making sure that you know they are playing the cards that they are dealt with. So because the, the basis of blockchain is really that information is publicly available. And then you have Nansa and you have analytics software that's really tracking everything. So how do you make sure that you as you no know, as an incubator accelerator of sorts actually have this advantage? Is really really making sure that you are securing your alpha. And I think traders and, and even all funds and et cetera is really taking advantage of this. And then subsequently, it's really a confidence game and a narrative game. In the old financial system, when people are making large sums of investments, they don't really review that until the end of the quarter, for example. But for, uh, but right now on the blockchain, they could kind of like make sure that, hey, you know, like, hey, it's a, if, it's a, if it's a narrative that I'm building, I'm, I want to make sure that everybody knows that I, I'm even buying in in the first place. Yeah, so that's that's a that that's a narrative that actually that, that's actually being told. On the flip side of things, blockchains in general, protocols are also experimenting with uh, zero knowledge knowledge proofs, uh, mm -hmm. fully implemented in a couple of uh, layer ones actually. Uh, on Algorand, it's something that we are actively developing. The idea is that at the end of the day, we could make transactions pseudonymous. Uh, to a large extent, but they are never really anonymous in a sense. Yeah, so that's that's the loop, loop it out. Look, I think inherently um, this is where the, let's say the pressure or, or, or kind of like a, a fissure point between like traditional uh, financial markets and DeFi and crypto and decentralized markets come into play. Traditional financial markets, like information is key, right? The idea that you know who you're dealing with, you know who your counterparties, you're accountable for all of those components, right? It, it's critical, right? It, it's why centralized exchanges went from not taking any KYC information to taking KYC information. Um, and why I anticipate that like uh, more decentralized applications will at some point, uh, there'll, be a, there'll be a group that always maintains this idea of, uh, um, continue like independence, right? And uh, from the financial ecosystem uh, and bridge it with stable coins and the ability for folks to get back into fiat if they need to. And there'll be another group that's built for the idea that let's take the technolo technological application, utilize it, but like apply still like the frameworks that are required to operate in some level of scale from, a, from regulated entities, right? And in, the, in that particular group, I don't see how like there won't be eventually this idea of uh, centralized sources of information for K KYC, or at least it could be decentralized, but at least uh, sharing of that KYC data. I think in terms of like whether folks will understand how much a particular person is trading, I think if you look at folks like Fireblocks, right, people that were, are like folks that are utilizing our system, they have multiple vaults, multiple wallets. I mean, they're creating, you can create multiple strategies for how you do that, right? Like the idea that uh, there's no limit to the number of Ethereum wallets you could spin up or uh, Algorand wallets or Terra wallets. You, you can spin up at Fireblocks. You could spin up thousands if you wanted to and integrate those against APIs and manage funds efficiently uh, that way to, to, to mask, you know, trading in a single bucket with single size, right? So I think there are things that can be done from a, let's say an operational capacity, um, as in you still control the funds, you still control the way that you want to organize the fund structure from a treasury perspective, that I think is different, right? If you go to a bank or you go to uh, uh, you know, a centralized entity, right? You have one account at that bank, you might have two or three, right? Um, someone knows that you're holding on to billions of dollars at BNY Mellon, right? Okay, but at the end of the day, you can distribute billions of dollars across 100 different wallets and no one would really know, you know, that particularly uh, was from QCP or Algorand or from Steven.co, right? So there's still a certain level of independence that's there. Um, but like I said, I think from a KYC AML perspective, we'll have two distinct tracks, one that operates more autonomously and feeds into the, the basis of what you know, digital assets was supposed to be, which is freedom from financial market systems. And there's another one that say, let's take advantage of what this new technology is doing and the yields and, and the efficiency there, but we still require a certain level of transparency in order to meet regulatory needs. Yeah, absolutely. And then I think, um, I don't want to 
it's been too much time around regulation, um, but I think it seems like to be a topic based on some of the questions that folks on, online are asking. So maybe I'll touch upon just a couple of questions there. And it starts with Daniel on, on your side, you know, you mentioned earlier around, you know, consumers are coming in to a B2C model in, in DeFi. I think you combine that with a, some of the regulation changes that has been happening in Singapore at the moment, um, how do you foresee that play out, right? It, 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 you know, it, are, are the regulators in the region are looking at this space in DeFi from a B2C perspective? Is it still just B2B? Um, what's happening there? Yeah, definitely. So I, I, I think for DeFi, it's really like, you know, like as, as what uh, retail investors will look at it, it's really the Wild West actually. So what, what do we really think of it as the Wild West? It's because a lot of applications have uh, you know, um, methods or kind of like algorithms that they do not understand. So when, when a lot of retail users are actually using this application, they do not fully understand what they are entering into. And that's why regulators are concerned actually. The, the, the main reason is that uh, you know, regulators worldwide, you know, Dubai, Singapore, the main idea is that they want to protect consumers. They want to make sure that you no know, people are investing in, in the correct uh, things. Uh, that's that's from their perspective and then uh, f with regards to really personal investments and stuff like that I think the De DeFi is just one of the many many things that you could actually put your money you know like there are people who are investing in like you no know, uh, Omega swatch watches you know holding like 20 of them and 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 that's and that's what they want uh, the other people are really looking at attracted to use on DeFi for example so the, the, the regulators, to be very frank, uh, like what Stephen has said earlier, really are two to three years behind. Uh, but the idea is that they, they are really here to make, make it a safe place for users. And I think that's that's really the, the utmost focus, to be very frank. And, and, and Darius, and this might be a good time to, to discuss with you, because I recalled, you obviously guys being a Singapore-based business and are working very closely with regulators locally and then working with the teams there. Uh, what are your thoughts there around this topic? No, I think Daniel has hit the nail on the head, right? Uh, the regulators are most concerned about protecting retail. Um, but with that said, I mean, DeFi is, DeFi is difficult to regulate. Uh, and I think every regulator is scratching their heads about, about it, right? It's easy to... <clears throat> one way is to regulate the gateways where, where fiat enters crypto. Uh, another way is, is, you know, like Stephen mentioned, to, to create permission DeFi uh, pockets. Um, but essentially, once once you know your fiat turns into crypto, crypto hits hits uh, 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 the DeFi protocols and it goes between wallets. It becomes very difficult to to to, to regulate and very difficult to identify uh, exactly how. So I think you know it, it is a problem for regulators and and, and regulators are also able to are only able to to manage um, companies that are within their jurisdiction, right? I mean you know if you have a DeFi company that's based in Panama or wherever you know, uh, it's very difficult to regulate as well. So I think it's going to continue to be a challenge and DeFi is going to continue to be a big uh, question mark. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, up, up to the players, the guys you know, like yourselves, you know, uh, the protocols uh, to, to, to keep users safe in that sense. Um, but yeah, I think regulation is a very tricky one for, for when it comes to DeFi. Great. Um, I just have a couple of questions here and, and then, you know, I got 12 minutes left on the clock here. Um, so I think, Dan Daniel, um, let's switch gears a little bit, right? I think we talked about decentralized finance and, and that being a use case when it comes to decentralization. Are there any other forms of dApps you're seeing adopter, uh, adoptions happening? I think beyond just users, um, in your view, are there any kind of type of application that's getting a lot of uh, developers resources being spent on because I think ultimately what folks don't realize is we're from a centralized world where you know banks build infrastructures but when it comes to centralized world ultimately developers and and, and the protocol managers are the ones who are building that infrastructure so what are you seeing there yeah that, that's right so really in terms of like running a layer one it's 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 really a lot of work to be very frank like I, I always like to say that the, the whole idea about running a, a protocol is like, example, you are running Windows as well as uh, Microsoft Azure at the same time. So the idea is that, hey, it's it's really a big scope. And a lot of times we have uh, developers referring to protocols as uh, ecosystems because it's really that big, actually. So the, the idea is when you are actually trying to build an ecosystem, it requires a lot of people to to participate. So you have the protocol engineers at the, the base layer, 
working on the consensus. For example, I, I saw John mentioning uh, POA, POS, etc., and also proof of work. Okay. Then you also have the have the, the team really building the infrastructure that's like fire blocks and, and also providing accelerators, incubators like right now QCP. And I think that's in the in the middle layer that's working together with, with us, Algorand, you know, the guys at, at other the other foundations. Then we have the applications. So the applications would be you no, know, like I mentioned earlier, for example, DYDX or, or even Ave mentioned by Davis earlier. So the idea is that there's really three layers, three massive layers of of uh, of of uh, that, that's working together to actually deliver this experience to to our users and and even traditional finance users actually. So it's really large scope. Uh, one thing that I wanted to mention that is that a lot of things that's taking place in the blockchain space is really creative based. So for example, Steve Stephen mentioned that three years ago, we were really looking at using applications to carry out the KYC. But as blockchain analytics really starts to make a move and really starts to grow really heavily, you know, as up and answer over the past two to three years, the idea is that we could even apply pseudonymous whole of blockchain KYC. You know, and, and that's going to come out from some blockchain companies within the space. And that, in order for that to actually happen, it requires uh, the, the guys over on the KYC AML side, that, that side of the industry to really be pushing the envelope. And the, the demand is really coming from the blockchain industry. So these are some types of innovation that we can really look at and really support. And in from the protocols perspective, from example, Algorand Foundation's perspective, we're always funding all these initiatives. We want to make sure that you know, the regulators are kind of like well looked after, our users are well looked after, and we are protecting everyone. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, there's, there's something I always note. I, I, I was in a talk the, the other day, and I, I was noting the level of one collaboration, I think, as Daniel mentioned, these three levels or, or layers, right? But there's a certain layer level of collaboration that's occurring across the ecosystem. Folks that are actively participating, trading, earning revenue, folks that are building on the, the, the layers or the application layer, and then the folks that are building on the infrastructure layer, right? And, and all these people are, are, are coming together and kind of pushing the space forward. Well, I think if you if you look at like the level of innovation that's occurring, the fact that three years ago was maybe a little too early for common KYC, but probably I think over the next 12 months, you'll see some level of someone bring in some level of a decentralized pseudonymous KYC application on blockchain in a distributed way that would probably find a level of common uh, acceptance across multiple DeFi applications. If you think about the level of pace that we're moving at, uh, if you open a bank account at DBS and you open an account, bank account at OCBC, there's no level of common information that's really required across the board. And these banks have been around for years and years and years, let alone Citi and JP Morgan, right? But in the digital asset space, you will see probably that level of like innovation and, and adoption happen uh, within, you know, what I'd say is uh, another, you know, 12 to 18 months. Right. Let alone the fact that this whole space is probably uh, it, it's sub it's sub uh, 12 plus years old, 12 years old. Right. So, like, I just think the level of pace that you're seeing right, and the innovation, I think, it, is something that um, I think a lot of people don't get credit for in the digital asset space. It's just how much we are adapting and shifting to meet the needs from regulators and consumers and retail applications and even traditional finance uh, to, to a certain extent. So. You know, I, I think people, you know, while there's going to always be a sector of the market that is just continually moving and innovating ahead of like regulatory pace, I think in general, the speed of adoption, the speed of like trying to find easier ways of working, I think is, is something that is unique to this space that I don't think um, maybe folks in the traditional space give it enough credit for uh, in my mind. So I think on that, I'm going to actually ask a question because I noticed what we talked about today, DeFi is really, in my opinion, a way of how values are being exchanged, right? Either a centralized or a decentralized way. In, in the world of DeFi, it's done a decentralized way. But let's talk about like assets that are now being exchanged in a decentralized way. So I think the two questions here really asked was about NFTs and CBDC, uh, CBDCs, right? Which are two different forms of assets that could live in a decentralized world, how they transact. Um, so, so the first question really is NFTs plus DeFi. Do we see any conversions there? Do we see any divergence? What does that look like? Um, maybe, you know, Darius, you want to tackle that first and anybody else want to jump in? 
Yeah, I mean, DeFi is a financial ecosystem, right? Um, the same way the banks and financial institutions are in, in, in traditional finance. Uh, but the financial e e ecosystem doesn't exist on its own. Uh, you need use cases, you need industries um, and to, to, to sort of have to, to run an economy, right, essentially. <clears throat> NFTs, uh, GameFi are the two, what I would say, the two largest industries in crypto now. And DeFi is a financial ecosystem that supports activity in NFTs in GameFi, right? You, you make, you, you, let's say you, you, do, you, you participate in play to earn, you earn your tokens, you, 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 you know, you, then you, you bring it to DeFi to trade it, to invest. Uh, if you are a project in, 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 in an NFT project, you sell your NFTs. Now you have a bunch of stable coins. What do you, where do you put the stable coins, you know, to where do you, store, where do you uh, stake them or where do you store them? So it's not a one or the other. I think, uh, you know, DeFi is the bank or the, you know, inv investing, trading, trading a, 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 a um, layer for NFTs, for GameFi and for whatever industry, Web2 industry that, you know, uh, Web2 to Web3 industry that, that sort of pops up, you know, whether it be sports, or you know any other thing that you can think of so uh in, in, that, that's the relationship i think yeah i mean i, I was going to say right the, inherently the thing that's exciting about this space is that uh the ecosystem gets to decide what's valuable right and, and what's important in the space right so the idea in my mind of someone collateralizing or taking a loan against an nft right, it isn't something that is so far off as far as what, or, or the different applications, right? Not only the fact that you have to convert it out, but like the idea that you may want to have a long-term hold on this asset, but you may want to be able to borrow against it uh, in, in a way that makes a lot of sense, right? And generally you had to go to a centralized entity to do that and for someone to ascertain that value. The nice part about all these different dApps that are happening is someone is building code on top of a, uh, of a blockchain basis and they get to decide how they feel like that, that, that application is going to work and the inherent value. And that if that's attractive enough, then people will kind of move in that direction and, and take advantage of it. Right. And I think that, that to me um, is the exciting part. I, I think for like things like CBDCs, I think it's just a view on whether, how you think CBDCs are going to occur, right. Whether or not CBDCs will be wholesale or retail. I personally believe they'll be wholesale, not retail, right? So I think the idea is that we're going to see more and more banks issue stable coins based off of commercial bank money. Um, that makes the most sense. Financing is, uh, well, it used to be very cheap. Um, and, and so, you know, they're going to issue, you know, you're going to see the likes of uh, JP Morgan and other city issue, you know, you know, stable coins on based off of the commercial bank money. I think CBDCs are going to be used for wholesale clearing uh, and obligations between banks, right? Uh, optimize what is inefficiencies that you might see from CLS and other uh, central FMIs, and they're going to basically do that. So I don't see CBDCs like directly getting to retail in the case that we saw with like uh, what you saw in China. I, I think on on a more Western basis, it, it will be you know bank to bank um, and, and institution to institution. So I don't think that factors as much, but I do think eventually you'll see you know you know commercial bank monies issued stable coins from the likes of others get utilized in DeFi applications as folks get more comfortable with the idea of these stable coins being issued on on public blockchains, the likes of what we're seeing with ANZ in Australia. Yeah, for sure. I think what's interesting about the industry that we currently live in, if you look at history of money, and really back in the days, people used to trade goats for apples, and it was a really inefficient way of transmitting value. So money was invented as a common denominator to transmit value. And since then we've developed, and now we have digitized version of assets, right? Which now is very common and very easy to trade and very easy to transact. We have whole entire infrastructure built on top. So actually the race is on between a digitized version of money or just native digital currency that is living in the ecosystem that we're currently operating. And how that developed is probably why all of us are super excited about our jobs and, and working in this industry that is continually and facilitating this ecosystem.
So, so that being said, I got a minute left and I'm getting the wave of hand from our organizers that uh, we might have to wrap this up. Do you have time for answer one more questions or um, can we do have to wrap this up? Folks from Mayor Jane, so far. guidance there? I mean, we can definitely extend the session. Uh, let's not end on the dot. <laughs> I'm pretty sure everyone's invested in this uh, topic already. <laughs> Perfect, perfect. So I think uh, I think that the last few questions really could be summarized in, in one question, which is like, how should folks get involved? Where should they learn? How do they protect themselves? And knowing all the different informations out there that is being presented, uh, you know, I want to ask the three panelists, um, you know, how should individuals or institutions get involved in, in this space? And what are some of the things you need to do to learn about this space? Maybe Stephen, you want to start us off and yeah. So, so look, I, I think um, as in anything, like well, I'll, I'll bring it, I'll look at it from a security perspective, right? So uh, the space is new and emerging, right? And there's a question around, like, uh, I think I saw uh, it's, it's free, it's folks are building, uh, you know, inherently, right? There's always a risk of folks going to market and not thinking about things like security and, and managing wallet infrastructure, right? Which is like, you would think it's like baseline level number one, but it may not be, right? Getting to market may be the most important thing. And so I, I think from my perspective, it's it's understanding that uh, as in anything that you're operating that's in a new space, you need to do your due diligence on uh, who are the teams behind it? Uh, what are their security, like what is their thesis around like securing assets and securing the actual code itself and, and, and what they're building and implementing on? And then not take a singular trust basis, right? So if you look at what's happening with folks like Fireblocks, um, uh, MetaMask, uh, Gnosis Safe, like all these folks are, are building infrastructure to make sure that basically as you connect into these different DeFi applications, you actually think about security uh, from your perspective, right? And I think that's one of those things that I think folks need to think about, right, is not only like how much money are you going to earn from a yield basis or uh, you know uh, what that looks like but you know how do you secure the money that you already have and how it interacts with these different DeFi applications i think is a thing to pay a lot of attention to um and and to make sure that you're building in the right operating models and the right security models to to interact with these safely and not just take like the application at face value that you anticipate it's secure, but say, okay, if there were something to occur, a militia event to occur, how do I mitigate and minimize risk, right? How do I think about the risk thresholds of like how much funds I'm putting on any particular application at any one time? Those are things that we do in traditional markets. You, you evaluate counterparty risk. You say, how much money am I willing to put at uh, BitMEX and Bitstamp and Coinbase and Kraken, right? What kind of co counterparty risk do I want to take to OTC providers and to market makers? You should do the same thing for DeFi, right? How much risk am I willing to take? What's the tolerance and the threshold? If there was a collapse, what's the kind of risk losses that I would anticipate? How do I make sure that my wallets don't get drained, right? What do I put the right policy and governance over the wallets that I own from a treasury perspective to make sure that I limit losses and do those things? And I think sometimes that gets overlooked and it should be something that is first and foremost. Um, if you haven't read the, the email from Arthur from Defiance, uh, I think it's, it's a great email that is a, a really strong reminder of thinking about that security first basis uh, as you interact with with these different applications. And, and, and Dara is coming from your view as someone who do think about these security risks and enter in the space and actively participate in this space. Um, you know, what are some devices there from your perspective? So funnily, funnily enough, I, I, I got the same phishing email that Arthur got, you know, uh, <laughs> that, 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 that led to him getting uh, his Azuki hacked. Um, and it, it was very tempting to open it as well. You know, it comes from somebody that you know. And, uh, but I, I don't have much to add to what Stephen is saying. I think it's a very tricky thing. Um, you know, unless you are a uh, cyber security, you know, I mean, an uh, 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 encryption specialist yourself and, and you're looking at the code, you have to rely on, on audits. You have to rely on, on audit results and, uh, and peer to sort of peer validation. And I mean, even the, the, even the, the best of projects get exploited as well. So uh, I completely agree with what Steven said, you know, I think a lot of it comes down to risk management. Uh, there is always going to be a bit, bit of a question mark when it comes to the, to the security. Um, but yeah, you know, making, making sure that, that you're not, don't have all your eggs in one basket, 
uh, you know, because I mean, a lot of these, a lot of these, to, to be clear to, to our listeners, a lot of these hacks are not hacks per se, they are exploits of the code, meaning that, uh, meaning that, that it's not, it's not like somebody brute force, uh, you know, uh, their way through something, it's, it's a, a mistake in the code, so to speak. So, you know, I think uh, vulnerabilities are always going to be there. Uh, so, you know, how you allocate your risk is very important. Excellent. And, and, and Daniel, to, to wrap us up, um, from a protocol perspective, um, how are you guys looking at this? What are the folks needs to be watching out for? Yeah, definitely. So one, one thing that we definitely want our users to kind of like watch out for is, hey, you know, if the use are 5,000% or 10,000%, just make sure, you know, like you're respecting the alarm bells that are in your head, like use are not supposed to be that high. Uh, an, an, another thing to make sure is really what the, uh, Darius and, and, and Stephen has actually covered is like really be aware of your, your personal security. So in this space, we call it OPSEC, so uh, operational security. Make sure that you no, know, if you are a user of uh, anything actually, uh, NFT, DeFi, or even just pure crypto, don't be clicking on links, you know, like if somebody sends you something, it might be spear phishing, like what Darius has uh, experienced. Don't open links from people that you do not know. It's it's at the end of the day, it's really something that I I always make make a joke, right? I always say that hey, you know, you if you don't lose all your money in in crypto or blockchain by making a mistake, you're probably gonna lose it somewhere else in the future actually, because all of these guys really in the in that space, the cyber cyber security space, and the guys really taking advantage of normal users actually are uh, really increasing in their methods. So recently in Singapore, there has been kind of this internet banking issue that happened, a lot of people lost their funds. So the idea is really to make sure that you as a user in, in this space, in, in, the, in, in the idea of a world where internet is so connected, right? you have to make sure that you are taking the responsibility for your own funds, uh, ensuring that, hey, you know, when you have a link, make sure that no, you don't just click it. Yeah. Excellent. Well, well, thank you guys. Uh, so much for, for sharing your insights. Uh, we've had a really exciting hour of discussions and you know, for everyone that is listening, thank you guys so much for your time and tuning in and uh, looking forward to part three of the series. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thanks.